What's going on guys? Welcome to part five of JavaScript under the hood. So in this video, we're going to have uh, a look at JavaScript engines. Now we've talked about things like the threat of execution and the call stack and, and all of this does happen within the JavaScript engine. However, what I want to focus on in this video is what happens when your source code is actually interpreted and executed. What are the stages that it goes through to get to being machine code that runs on the CPU? Okay, and we'll also look at the different engines that each browser uses. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. All right, guys, so all browsers have a JavaScript engine, which essentially is a software component in the JavaScript runtime environment that interprets, optimizes, and executes JavaScript code. Now, the first engines were just mere interpreters, but modern engines are much more intricate and do a lot more optimization, including something called JIT or just-in-time compilation to increase performance. And I'll talk more about this later. Now, most engines are written in languages like C and C++. Different browsers use different engines. They all essentially pretty much do the same thing at a high level, but they do differ in their approach. And I'll mostly be talking about the V8 engine that Google Chrome uses and that Node.js uses when I talk about the inner workings. So let's just quickly look at the different engines that each browser uses. So Mozilla Firefox uses SpiderMonkey, which was actually the, the very first JavaScript engine created. And it was created by the creator of JavaScript itself, Brendan Eich or Brendan Eck. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but it was used in the Netscape Navigator browser for those of you that are old enough to remember that as I am. And then later on, it was open sourced and is now is currently maintained by the Mozilla Foundation. And then the V8 engine is what Google Chrome uses, as well as Node.js. It's extremely fast. I believe it's the fastest JavaScript engine. Uh, don't quote me on that, but uh, I'm pretty sure I've heard that multiple times. It can be it can run standalone or it can be embedded into a C++ application. Uh, and of course, it's used with Node.js, which is a JavaScript runtime that lets us run JavaScript on the server. Um, next, we have Chakra, which is what Microsoft Edge uses. And Internet Explorer also used an engine called Chakra, but it was actually a JScript engine. JScript was Microsoft's legacy dialect of the ECMAScript standard. So it was basically like Microsoft's version of JavaScript. Um, one unique feature of Chakra is that it compiles scripts on a separate CPU core parallel to the web browser. And then Safari uses something called JavaScript Core, uh, along with a, a bunch of other Apple applications. And uh, Safari also uses a rendering engine called WebKit, and all WebKit browsers use the JavaScript Core engine. Um, it provides the ability to evaluate JavaScript programs from within Swift, Objective-C, and C-based apps. All right, so those are the major browsers and the engines that they use. Now, before we look at the inner workings of the JavaScript engine, I just want to talk about compiling versus interpreting or compiled languages versus interpreted languages. So JavaScript is what we call an interpreted language. And then languages like C and C++, these are compiled languages. Now, compile languages means you, you write the code, you run the code through a compiler, Uh, and, it, and it turns it into something called machine code. And this is usually represented with ones and zeros. And a computer, or I should say a, a CPU, doesn't directly understand JavaScript or even C or C++. It only understands machine code. Now, since languages like C and C++ are directly compiled to machine code, they're extremely fast and powerful. You know, they, they do have that extra step of compilation, but that only happens once, and then your compiled code is executed from there on. All right, now with an interpreted language like JavaScript or Python or Ruby, the code is not directly compiled into machine code, at least not all at once. So you don't have that extra step. Instead, the interpreter reads your code line by line, checking for errors, and runs the program simultaneously. So it interprets statements into machine code, and statements include source code, pre-compiled code, and scripts. 
So at the end of the day, we always end up with machine code, but the way we get there is different. Now, the analogy that I, I thought of, and I think um, makes sense, at least to me, is if you were in a foreign country and you needed to have a conversation with someone you know, that spoke a different language, compiling is like stopping and taking the time to learn the entire language. And interpreting would be like having someone there to interpret each word or each sentence. So compiling does take, long, uh, take longer in the beginning, obviously, to learn the language but then you know the entire language so you have a fast and smooth conversation where interpreting doesn't take all that time to compile but the conversation is going to be slower because you have to interpret every word or every sentence all right so compile language they, they take longer to create something which is called write time but they have an extremely fast run time where interpreted languages have a short write time um, you know, you can write and test your code quicker, but they have a slower runtime. They're typically not as powerful. So I know that was kind of an aside, but I think it's good to know the, the, the general difference between compiled languages and interpreted languages. So what I want to do now is show you the process of getting our JavaScript source code, you know, all of our functions and arrays and objects and variables get that to machine code which is just ones and zeros that can run on the cpu now at one point javascript engines were just simple interpreters basically like just this step here or these couple steps but uh, over time they've become more intricate and they can optimize code better and they're a lot faster than they used to be and of course every javascript engine works in a different way this is really my understanding on the v8 engine which is the engine that i've studied the most um, and it depends on what time frame you're talking about as well because the v8 engine worked in a different way just a couple of years ago all right so keep that in mind but basically we have our source code that we write and then the first step is it's going to go into the parser and the parser will check your source code which is your your javascript code um, and it will go through line by line and make sure that the syntax is correct if it comes across an error it stops running and sends out that error now if the code is valid it generates something called an apps an abstract syntax tree or ast which is a tree of nodes that represent the code. And each node of the tree denotes a, a construct occurring in the text. And you can almost think of it as like, like how the JavaScript DOM is, the document object model. Now the AST doesn't include things like parentheses, curly braces, quotes. It just represents the code as a tree of nodes. Um, the AST is also not unique only to JavaScript, it's used in many other languages as well. Now there's actually a website called AST Explorer that allows you to input some code. It can be JavaScript as well as many other languages, and it will show you what the actual AST looks like. So I, I just found this the other day and I thought it was pretty cool. So let's just go ahead. Can I make this bigger? Let's, yeah, let's do that. So we'll say const X equals 100. And as you can see over here, we now have a variable declaration. It has a type, the start, and, um, and then in declarations, if we uncollapse this, we should be able to see the value. Yep, so in this init right here, you'll see the value 100, and the identifier has a name of X. So this is what it's going to look like when your code is, is turned into this abstract syntax tree. Um, and then if I were to add, let's say, a function, uh, we'll call it add 10, and we'll pass in x, and then let's just do a return, and we'll just say we want to return x plus 10, and we'll close that up. So now if we look over here, let's just collapse the, uh, yeah, so now you see the variable declaration. Underneath that, we now have a function declaration. And, and I'm not going to pretend I know exactly how to read this, but you can see the identifier has a name of add 10. We have the params, so the param of x, and then in the body we have a return statement. We have an argument uh, binary expression, and then the left identifier is going to be the x, so name x, and then the right is going to be the value of 10. So um, just to give you an idea of, of you know, what happens behind the scenes. 
So now let's go back to my little diagram here. And once we have that AST, next we have the interpreter whose job it is to take that AST and transform it into something called bytecode, which is an IR or intermediate representation. So you can think of it as an abstraction of machine code or small building blocks that make up any JavaScript functionality when you compose them together. Again, you don't have to fully understand this stuff. I'm just giving you a, a high level overview. Now, you may ask, why doesn't the interpreter compile directly to machine code? Well, one reason is because machine code is unique to the architecture of your machine. So machine code for Intel based processors is going to be different than machine code for ARM processors and bytecode or any intermediate representation is universal. Uh, another reason is because we can run optimizations on bytecode. Now, most engines use something called JIT compilation or just in time compilation which will take our bytecode and transform it into machine code on the fly. And a JIT compiler helps optimize your code because it has access to certain dynamic runtime information. So the SpiderMonkey engine uses a JIT compiler called IonMonkey and the V8 engine uses, um, uh, I think it's called TurboFan. And like I said earlier, with a compile language like C, your entire code is compiled before execution. That's called AOT or ahead of time compilation, where just in time compilation refers to compilation at runtime. And again, it allows for optimizations. All right. And then finally, the machine code is then run by the machine's hardware. All right. So I know that that's a lot to take in technically. You don't need to know all this stuff for practical web development, but I think it can help to just understand what happens under the hood. And some of this stuff can also be asked in interview questions for uh, for dev jobs just to see how much, you know. Uh, all right. So I think that that's going to be the end of the series for now. Like I said in the last video, I am open to suggestions. If you think, you know, if you have something that you think will fit in this series, um, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a like and maybe share with some other people and that's it. Thanks so much for watching.